All right. Good evening, everyone. And I welcome you to the fourth um, iteration of the Rutgers Business School Master Series. And uh, tonight I'm very pleased to um, welcome Paul Gustafson. Um, he's a leading management consultant specializing in strategy, organizational design, business process improvement, leadership development, the design of high performance teams and work systems, as well as change management and launch management. For more than 40 years, Paul has made major contributions to the organizational performance business and businesses across multiple industries and for many of the world's top companies. His work has been featured in over 50 books, company magazines, and periodicals. In the early 70s, he began an in-depth study of high-performance teams and the systemic design of high-commitment work systems. Paul's the co-author of A Team of Leaders, Power of Living by Design, and Running into the Wild. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome Paul. Um, but first, let me also make sure I introduce uh, our co-host and those of you who've been here for um, a couple of these webinars uh, obviously know Sunny Nastase. She's an executive spanning a 20 plus year period. She's had leadership roles in supply chain, healthcare, e commerce, sustainability, and more. Most recently, stepping away from UPS as president of the healthcare sector. She's a relentless advocate for addressing the critical element of people within organizational structures and has deep experience on how to structure new organizations and departments and revitalize mature organizations and departments to drive increased efficiency and produce better outcomes. And also, Bob Ferlado is a senior operations and supply chain executive with more than 20 years of experience transforming and integrating end-to-end -end supply chains. He has made major contributions creating value and role spanning the supply chain continuum from R&D, process engineering, technology planning to procurement, demand and supply planning, manufacturing, logistics and customer service. Both Sunny and Bob serve as members of the Massive of Supply Chain Management Board of Advisors at Rutgers Business School and they are our co-hosts so I'm turning it right over to them. Good to be with you Sunny. I just wanted to mention um not sure if uh, Rudy and others know but you are a multifaceted individual besides being an accomplished and effective supply chain executive, you also happen to have graduate degrees in, I think it's organizational behavior, where you studied at University of Pennsylvania. So that's impressive. And I know tonight's topic is especially interesting for you because, because of that. So it is. Thanks. Thanks for that, Bob. And just for everyone who's joined us, um, let me add my welcome to you, Paul, and, and to our guests and remind everyone that we will be taking questions through the chat function and um, Brody Sheldon will be uh, monitoring the chat. So as we get up on about 10 minutes before the top of the hour, we'll go ahead and have a Q&A, Paul, for you so, so the folks in the audience can have a chance to pick your brains a little bit and maybe provide some of their own um, either observations or, or commentary about the, the session. Um, in addition, we have a YouTube channel, which is getting quite a lot of hits these days. So we thank you all for coming back and either reviewing the content that you've seen or perhaps sharing it um, or dropping in if you're not able to attend live. So. so let's not forget that we're going to be talking about leadership, silo busting, and designing your supply chain and organization. I have a line. There's an interesting... Uh, interesting video with sound so um to that end uh i know you agree with me sunny that with the uh, the need greater than ever for alignment and integration of supply chain organizations both within companies and their extended supply environment tonight's topic is timely and to drive uh, or the drive rather the functional excellence uh, which in turn perpetuates functional silos and misalignment in organizations hampers supply chain performance both within companies as well as within the supply chain ecosystems they participate in. And so for our audience members, if you're an operations or supply chain professional, a leader, an executive, or work in any other function of a company at any level, tonight's guest will absolutely add to your insight and professional toolbox. And to be sure, our guest will help us break down those limiting organizational silos. Now, for more than 30 years, Paul Gustafson has been a friend and valued mentor. Paul has been described as a true workplace visionary whose expertise in the area of business strategy, 
organizational design, knowledge management, team development, and change management is unchallenged. And following a series of corporate roles, Paul established his own company, Organization Planning and Design. And Rudy mentioned that he's also co-author of a team of leaders. Um, he, you know, he's he's gone on to make lasting transformational impact in many U.S. major corporations, as well as startup organizations and sports teams. Paul's been one of the most impactful individuals in my professional development. And I'm very grateful for his mentorship, his insights, and lessons that have guided my professional journey. So, Paul, I wanted to welcome you, say it's a thrill and a privilege to have you with us tonight, and thanks for joining us. Well, those are a lot of kind words. Uh, <clears throat> the The blessing in my life is working with great people like you that we can all learn together from. So this is all part of uh, an opportunity to give back as I see it. And so how could I resist the, the, the request? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I appreciate that, Bob. Um, so Paul, Listen, um, as, as all the accolades that rolled out here as we started up the session prove, you have been a tireless advocate for workplace design and how leaders make that all come together or not. Um, your leadership in this space is really quite remarkable. But my question for you is this. What, what was the influence that really spurred your passion for the subject or or what sort of inspiration led you to ha have a lifelong career in this space? Yeah, thank you, Sonny. I, um, you know, there's a lot been written about why, you know, and uh, and what I can share with you, I, I grew up in the Midwest, Midwest uh, Overland Park, Kansas, great place for, for values and all those good things. Uh, things that go on and the upbringing um what i would what i would share with you is my that my father was an engineer my mom was a nurse and i realized that whatever happened at work came home so here i am a, a young toddler you know and and teenager and what and it was like this is my same parents but but whatever happened at work and and being in healthcare you know my my mom would talk about conflict between you know the the nurses just wanted to serve the patients but 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 then there were the doctors and then there was the administration and, and all the stuff that went on and you know I grew up thinking why is this because when things were good things were good you know hey Paul you want an apple pie you want this or that as opposed to have you, why haven't you mowed the grass, cut the, you know, pulled the weeds? What, you know, I'm thinking, you know, same parents. So I can remember sitting down with a vocational counselor in a high school, you know, and saying, saying, you know, when he said, what, what do you want to be? What do you want to study? You know, at the next level. And I said, you know, I, I'm interested in, in helping develop great places for people to work. Mm -hmm. You know that pregnant pause. Mm -hmm. No, I was talking about. Do you do you want to be an accountant? Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be? And 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 I had the opportunity to play uh, play football at the next level, and so we had same counselors, same story. You know, and I and I was just in search for. Shouldn't there be some program, something that teaches people? You know, and and the reason is because. If we believe that the uh, the home is a is a very important place and your community and all of those things, if things went well at work, you know, there's all this ripple effect, right? So it wasn't until I was a senior in in college I took a class in complex organizations and and I go, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for, and fortunately at Brigham Young University. Um, <clears throat> There was a, a new program with eclectic professors from Harvard and and uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Berkeley, that had come together and and started a program organizational behavior. And so, so this was, but the but I appreciate because no matter what project that I've been on, I, I'm still grounded on if we can create great places for people to work. 
it has such a ripple effect. And you know, you you've seen the data where where they're better contributors, they vote more, they contribute more in their communities, they they lead softball and soccer leagues. And if they can if if they can learn great skills and have a great environment, great things happen. So so that was my search. My 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 search still is my search after four decades is right. what are the elements that help create great places for people to work? And so maybe by the end of the next decade, I'll figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, Paul. We really very much appreciate the answer there. And um, you know, I think you you give some light to us when we take a look at the possibilities of what the workplace can be. Many of us have experienced where there's still a gap. So thanks for your your efforts there. Yeah, I also think um, a lot of leaders today forget that picture that Paul uh, painted for us that, you know, work impacts people's lives. They spend a lot of time there and uh, very often they're passionate about their work or they go into work tr tr being passionate. And, uh, you know, depending on how well the organization runs and supports their values and beliefs is you know, impacts them at home. So it's a really important area. You know, a question from me, Paul, uh, you've always reminded me, Bob, never forget in organizations, you get what you design for. Can you tell us more about that and how this perspective can get people thinking about organizational design as a catalyst to drive positive change? Yeah, sure. The, uh you know, the, and the 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 saying that I I like is organizations are perfectly designed to get the results that they get. So if you can you can frame that 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 you start with uh, a a mental way of looking at things that it just didn't happen. It just it, it it's not some osmosis that there's some sort of cause effect relationship. And uh, I had great professors at Brigham Young University. Um, one, Bill Dyer, who was a giant in the field and, and way back when, and, and in both teams. And, that. and he talked about having a, a good theory good about why people do things. But he, he taught about how important it was to have a framework, a, a way to think about that. And so that heavily influenced me. Um, I also had the opportunity growing up, uh, I played football for 10 years. I, I played under three Hall of Fame coaches. And, and I saw what you talked about in the beginning about leadership, how it had a, an effect. What, 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 and I was curious in, in terms of what were the design choices that drove the behavior of, of the team or the organization to achieve the outcomes that they have? And so, so I was really interested in in having a, a a framework because I do believe that there was a one of the pioneering articles in our in our field was an article written by Dick Walton many years ago from Harvard that 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 talked about work design and he had a sort of a three box model you know design elements uh, attributes and outcomes. And he also wrote a pioneering article from control to commitment, meaning essentially that choices that organizations make drive whether people have high commitment, which we would say today is high engagement, right? Or, or whether they feel controlled, you know, where people say, I'm just a pair of hands. I'm just, you know, I do all of this thinking outside, but when I come into work, you know, I'm a, treated like... You know, a pair of hands. So, so uh, you know, we we've also heard the Einstein. You know, is, is that insanity is is uh, doing the same thing over and over again, thinking you're going to get different results, right? So, so I think, and I do believe, after four decades, that that we do get what we design for. And so, if we do get what we design for, you ought to have a framework that helps you in terms of doing that. So. Interesting. You know, you've you've certainly heard all the, there's a big uh, focus on design thinking today. So design thinking is more of a systematic or intuitive 
customer focused, if you will, problem solving approach that organizations use. They they use it to respond rapidly to changing environments and and to create uh, maximum input. So a lot of the lessons and and um, approaches that you use and have taught me over the years really were some of the first. I guess, um, attempts at design thinking in organizations. Right, right. It's interesting. Let me let me shift gears a little bit. Um, just, and, be, just before you do yeah, shift gears yeah, in, in terms sure. of get what you designed for. Let, yeah. me share, let me share a simple thing that is, so so baseball is, is in the play, right? With spring uh-huh. training and all uh-huh. of that. So, yep. so, if someone says so, so give me a, an example that we would all relate to, no matter what we are. Okay, so if you know baseball, the average baseball game is two hours and fifty-eight minutes. So the so the Wall Street Journal wrote, but the ball is only in play eighteen minutes. So and you've seen the national pastime is 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 dwindling in terms of numbers of people attending games and that right? Yes. Well, in the world of, of video and all of that, so what? So what's interesting this year, if you hear what's going on in, in baseball, so again, we get what we designed for. And so I've looked at the data over the last 20 years. There's been a bunch of suggestions made, do this, do this. But this year, what they found is doing a, a few things that they have cut the time down by 25 minutes. The batter has eight seconds in the box uh-huh. the pitcher the, the the pitcher has 15 seconds you know the he can only throw over to first base three times the the so so there there are things there are what i could say you're perfectly designed to get the results that you get oh and 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 besides you have eight seconds if if you're not in the box in eight seconds ready it's a strike is so, that right so it's yeah. not it's not something. So I know that that's a minor thing, but for a student of organization design, you you begin to think about how design elements impact this. Absolutely. You know, no wonder we're bored. Eighteen minutes, the games that you know the balls in play, pitchers scoring, all of that, yeah. all that other time is is wasted time, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, thanks for clarifying these new rules because I was I heard about them, but I didn't really know what uh, what was entailed. But yep, you get what you designed for for sure. Very cool. So just let me shift gears now, if I could. So you know, one of the things that that Sonny and I talk about a lot are um, you know all of the work that's been done in supply chains to to you know strive and try to deliver supply chain excellence and organizational excellence. And after many years of investing and striving to build highly effective supply chain organizations, you know, high performance uh, and supply chain excellence has been elusive. And many leaders are, are now focusing on driving organizational alignment as a key ingredient to high performance. So I know you know a lot about this. And I'm interested in hearing so what does alignment in an organization look like? Yeah. So um, can we get in Doc Brown's Back to the Future flexible wheel machine and travel back in time for a, a couple of minutes? Would love it. Sure. Let's do it. So I had the opportunity to work for Dr. Federico Fagin, who uh, uh, invented the microprocessor when he was at Intel. And he started a company named Zilog in the kind of the entrepreneur Silicon Valley kind of way. And and so he designed this uh, Z80 microprocessor that exploded out in popularity. But the key deal was, could we make enough of these? And so so, um, I was attracted to come work with him. And he said to me, Paul, he said, "This this is what I know. I, I know if we do what everybody else does, we're just going to get the same results everybody else does. He said, so what I want you to do is help us think how we can do things different. Okay, so this was just a power. Here's one of the brightest guys, uh, Hall of Fame, you know, Inventors Hall of Fame, you know, an incredible 
Gene just simply said, he didn't give me the answer. He just said, I know from a manufacturing standpoint, if we do what we've done before, we'll get the same results. Sure. So so in, in the spirit of alignment, so I didn't know anything about making microchips, not a thing. So I learned that there were 140 steps, it took about six weeks to, to make this. As, as I looked at this, there was about 16 different departments, you know, functional specialties that you had. When I went into the cafeteria, I noticed, Bob, that each of those specialties were eating lunch or whatever it was with their own specialty. Hmm. They had their they they had their own language, CV plots, you know, elephants, boats, you know, that they, they had this, there was no common language amongst us. There were there were uh individual measures. So uh, as you know, the, the maintenance. Maintenance was measured on their their uptime. Not how many good microchips came out, hmm. but how often, you know, how much time was the, you know, so there was individual men. No one except a few engineers talked about the product itself. Of the 140 steps, it went back and forth 43 times to different to, to different functional specialties. Amazing. So if you ask the question, who owned the quantity, quality, cost, and timeliness of the product? Yeah. You, people, I guess people in the organizations, I mean, everyone should, right? But uh, maybe the other people are looking at themselves, well, well you do, or don't you? Well, the, and, and the, the people that were operating the equipment, the, the, they were measured on movements. Mm-hmm. Movements. Can you imagine going home and say, did you get your movement? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so so what I, I said is that there was a technology that was being developed, social technical system design that said that that if you look at energy, energy is neither created nor destroyed, right? It, it just changes its state. So state changes. So is there a way to look at the product being made? That, that that where you can talk about what's the state change. So a, a state change, if you think about it, if you had ice and you added heat to ice, it becomes water. You take water and you add heat to it and it's steam. So it's a distinct state change, a, a point where you can measure the quantity, quality, cost, and timeless. So, so what we did was we did an analysis of these 140 steps and, and said that there were four distinct changes you you developed transistors, so you built transistors, ones and zeros, right? Mm -hmm. You connected these ones and zeros together, so you could you could do something. You you protected those transistors, and then you singulated them so that they're microchips. And I, and the breakthrough happened was we said, what if we took all of these specialties? And what we did was we put them in four teams, and so the team downstream. That, that of the trans making the transistors knew the quality that went into theirs and and that they had all the expertise maintenance uh, operators uh, or technicians as we we call it diffusion photolithography everything and and instead of the language of the piece of equipment that they were using which Frederick Taylor would have been pleased about mm -hmm. but was destructive to the way that they were doing this is what if we talked about the language of the product. What is actually happening to the product? Mm -hmm. And what if we all were measured on the product? Not on how many movements, not how much the equipment was uh, up, not the uh, CV, but that we could, we could actually measure how the quality was. And to make a long story short, uh, without changing any piece of equipment, uh, two hundred and fifty five percent improvement over over the industry average at the time. Amazing. So, so that alignment was a huge deal. It was a new so if you and, and if you said to me, what was huge for me was talking in the language of the product, 
understanding what the value of the product had to the customer. Because be, before, it, it, if, if a person was working on a piece of equipment and they me were measured on movements, they had no idea what the customer, how that, how that helped. So those two things, but then the secret sauce, Bob, was organizing, organizing around the conversion process, which would you, you embrace so so great with clear outcomes, clear what 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 it is that we're producing, knowing in this particular case that the team downstream was your your customer, so to speak. Exactly. I love I love this example. You know, especially for supply chain professionals um, who are involved in a very complex system, a complex processes that they participate in and and manage, uh, you do see some of of uh, some attempts to bring, um, you know, the various verticals within supply chain together. I hate to use the term vertical, but try to bring what had previously been silos together and and organize them them properly. But I'm not so sure that especially young professionals coming up and even, even a lot of uh, leaders and executives and organizations understand this concept of how to proper, properly look at your process, get people aligned so you have uh, sort of uh, multifunctional folks working on the same thing. So it's not just you know folks in, in the planning, demand and supply, uh, working with manufacturing, working with customer service to the extent that it makes sense as you look at that process is so, so critical. So the message that you're bringing, I think, um, rings loud and clear to those people who are managing these complex processes. They probably just never had a chance to think of things in that way. So yeah, thanks very much for that, for that, that notion of what alignment looks like. Um, one other question, why, why is it so hard to achieve? Do you think why, why are companies still struggling to do this? Well, um, you know, what, I think uh, Frederick Taylor is alive and well in many organizations. If, if you remember when we went from, you know, the, <clears throat> the agriculture to the industrial and, and said, let's break jobs down to its simplest component. And then it's really easy to train people just to do this thing. Mm hmm and I think that's still alive and well today. It, it's not what high performance is about, but it's really easy to do. Um, you know, for example, if if you think about the Great Resignation, remember reading all about the Great Resignation. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. Well, so, so if there's high turnover, you know, what's easy? To, well, why don't we just hire a person to do this? N not thinking that just doing this. Is is going to be the reason why the person's going to leave, because they're only doing this, and and they aren't stepping back and seeing the big picture. Okay, so there's a customer out there that that has a, a need, like Clayton Christensen would would say, the job to hire for. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that so what is it that 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 the customer wants? How can we all be connected to that? And what's the process of making that happen? It, it's so easy. I, I, I think of it as, as the gravitational pull. I, I did some work with NASA years ago, and they said 80% of the fuel is consumed in the first three minutes of a liftoff. And, and I think that's the way it is in some organization. It takes enormous inertia where where the results can be so much better in terms of you know for example the organization I I talked about uh, the industry average at that time fifty five to one hundred percent turnover that wow. that organization organizing in the way they did six percent wow six percent because wow. if you if you were part of the making transistors or creating transistors, you had all kinds of skills that you could learn. I could learn the maintenance of it, the engineering of it. I could learn the quality of it. I could learn that sure. as opposed to sitting in a machine and just doing it. It's just the inertia. Sure. So, Paul, you're also sort of um, talking about this idea of silo busting, because when we think about concepts around 
functional excellence, which you're sort of touching on as you're discussing this topic. Um, one organization is designed to do its thing and it hands off within the larger organization to the next entity. And there's lots of things that can go wrong, both in terms of production, but also in terms of leadership. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, functional excellence and also if you would touch on your OSD model, um, because both of those things I think would be really helpful for our our guests to get their head around and compare your thoughts to their own organization. Sure, sure. Uh, can I take the uh, organizational systems design model first? You can, and I think we may even have a slide here. There we go. Thank you. So, so one of the things that uh, Bill taught me, Bill Dyer, who was a, a great mentor and influence and a giant in the in the organizational behavior field, is he said you need to have a framework. And and this this framework was really integrated from some great work that Dick Dalton uh, uh, Walton did at Harvard with Jay Galbraith, who was at, at Wharton and then USC. But essentially what it says, if you if you think about this from an open systems model, on the far left, it says, OK, there are a bunch of things going on in the environment that you need to pay attention to. Customers, technology, com competitors, uh, government regulations, uh, socioeconomic. You got to you, you got to understand that that piece We're we're not a closed system. We're an open system. So you start that. And then you go way to the right and you say, so what are our results? What's the MPS score, the net promoter score? What is the, what's the turnover and or presenteeism or, or that, that you have? What is the financial results that we have? What are operational? What are those? And then in thinking about the culture and knowledge that you have, noting that the culture and knowledge that we spoke about before from controller commitment and, and, and this notion of engagement that we talk about today, we we <clears throat> we can talk about um, psychological safety. We can talk about what what are those attributes, those cultural attributes that we believe drive the outcomes. So the fun part for me is so what are the what what are the levers that we have available to us, and and so borrowing from some work of a number of people. And knowing that there are 10 fingers or 10 toes, that there are 10 great categories that that I can you can think about as levers to in one place uh, create alignment, uh, which Bob talked about before. The the more that there's uh the more that there's alignment, the better. And so uh, I love the topic that you're talking about because when I say to people, when I talk to people about the power of this is, is that th this is this is not uh, a model that that um, tells you what to do. It helps you categorize and think about choices and and the relationship between those choices and the culture that you have. But the right. most difficult thing, which you both have talked about before, is is making sure that all of these are aligned, uh, aligned. So. The mission of the organization or a sense of purpose. We, we all know that if you can align the sense of purpose of the organization with individuals, great things happen. Principles that you're going to guide the organization uh, on, the philosophy that you have, strategies that, that you put into place in terms of marketplace positioning, uniqueness, goals and objectives in terms of what is it that you measure. I gave you the example before in terms of uh in, in terms of measuring people on on their um how many movements that they had i worked with an organization many years ago that had said had high turnover and and when they looked at the at the turnover they said you know you you have this framework that helps us go through and 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 understand and so what what i did was i said um, with these customer service people, there were thousands of these people doing this. Uh, um, what what's the measure? And they said uh, uh, average talk time. Well, the difference between measuring average talk time and telling people that you're you're uh, you know you're supposed to be hitting uh, you know 180 seconds and and you're at three you know you're at four minutes or whatever it is that you have sends a different message than than the measure in terms of um, 
our customer satisfaction and repeat customers growing the business. And then there are then there's the processes and the technical system in terms of uh, both the processes and the physical arrangements, how you're organized, where decisions are made, information that you have, the the kind of people skills that you need to have, how, how what do you do to reward people and and recognize them and renewal. So so the beautiful thing is in terms of design is to say, here's the sandbox we have to play in. These 10 categories will drive the culture and, and knowledge that you need to have in the organization to produce the outcomes. So to what extent are they doing what we intended them to do? So if you haven't clarified your outcomes, you need to clarify your outcomes. If you haven't clarified what you believe will cause those outcomes, then, then at least work on that. And once you've done that, then, then look at these 10 opportunities and understand how the top part I call direction setting, the, the, the bottom part is the system. How do they drive the, the behavior that we need? And then to make sure that they're all in alignment. And that's the hard thing. And, and that's where, when you think about the functional specialties, uh, Sunny, in, in terms of this, uh, imagine that that you were in engineering or you were in quality or you, that you were in finance or that you were in and and imagine the the things that you pay attention to uh, from that particular field to what extent to what extent are they aligned with the other functional ex expertise and where they can be where there can be this joint optimization in terms of choices to drive behavior. And so because we we have, you know, I'm on my sand, sandbox now, okay, yeah. I mean, is, that, is that without an integrating mechanism, some, some way to create linkages, you know, where everybody gets on the same page, you know, you have problems. You yep. have problems. And so that's why I think a process centric organization where, where it talks about, you know, what the outcomes are and and for each of those processes and how we that the, the, the top end, we need to have alignment on what those are. Um rather than drive the functional specialty, because then it's just a war of words as far as I'm concerned. Well, and you talk about alignment and you use that word a lot, but I loved your example when we were um, first meeting about the bakery and how that sh described to me very clearly. And I think most people can understand what you mean by alignment in that analogy. Can you share that? Yeah, so so one of the beautiful things about thinking about a bakery, and we talked earlier about uh, key lime pie, where you know if you, whether it's a, a pie uh, that you that you're you're making or a cake, if you if you think about this notion that was such a breakthrough in the semiconductor world of of state changes, if you think about the what goes on in the order to cash process. You, you think about a person coming in with a, a need um, for, a, you know, a, a, a special occasion. It could be a wedding. It could be an anniversary. It could, and you convert that need into an order, um, having used recipes and, and things. But the, the output is an order. And you take that order and you have some sort of procurement process that then, then produces raw ingredients. And you take that raw ingredients and you mix it up and you create batter. And then you, you take the, the batter and, and you heat that batter up in a baking process and you have a cake. And then you want to wow the customer for this special occasion and you want to decorate it. And, and so it just you know becomes a beautiful cake, decorated cake. Then you have to package it. And then you have to deliver that. And then you have to invoice for it, and you have to uh, you you then get payment. So there's this whole set of processes that if the if the the team 
that's making this, the people in the bakery understand, understand that we're all about meeting that customer need with a with an incredible cake that we have. And how do we participate in that? And, and recognizing what are the things that could happen upstream that could cause problems downstream. So just as an example, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the great cake making person, but if you, what I do know this in the mixing process, if you don't coat the pan, when it goes into, into the, the baking process, that, that having that cake come out, it's entirely possible that if that's not done well, that there'll be parts of the cake that will stick to the pan. Well, if you if you had a, a functional specialty where people were only looking at their, you know, I, I only uh, prepare uh, equipment for this. I only pour and measure equipment. I only do this. And, and you're not thinking that what we do could affect the people downstream in terms of this. Now, in, a, in an organization, I've seen this play out in many times like this, the people downstream, so if we talked about the baking, if they, if they got the cake out and it stuck, they, they would point their fingers upstream and say, you guys screwed us again. Look at the problems that, that you had. The people upstream are looking downstream and said, if you guys just build better skills, we know that you could take the cake out of the pan without it sticking. But, but Sunny, if you took those two groups and you, you get, got them focused on where we're creating batter, we're, pro, uh, we're producing a cake, and you put the boundaries of the work team around that, those two processes, they will collaborate in a way that is so different than, than if you just had a baking team and just had a mixing team. Right. And there's that alignment that you talked about. Thank you so much. Really, really cool, huh, Sonny? I mean, um, I just like to emphasize for those listening in how um, important this is to think about and try to bring back, back with you to your organizations. Um, the, 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 just, the, just the model itself. I, I love a framework to work with. And when I was introduced to this many years ago, it just, the light bulb went off. Uh, you know, I had a number of experiences in, in the company and just that 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 light bulb went off and whenever I think about an organization I think about you know it's it's a, the environment that it operates in I think about all of the, the the systems of alignment that need to happen and then of course you know how those affect the behaviors and feelings of folks in the organization and which in turn ultimately affect the outcome so I think so so important um a lot of folks, engineers and supply chain professionals never get exposed to that, but but so critical, especially if you're going to form teams, if you're going to try to tackle processes in, in operations or supply chain, so important. Right. And, and, and in, in our field, obviously, it's everything is so connected from the original sourcing all the way to the end. It's exactly. very easy to get in those silos and and not really recognize everyone's collective responsibility across and to build and and re continually redesign with that in mind as conditions change. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Just as an illustration, I worked with an organization not too long ago who were saying uh, we need your help in in redesigning the work of a particular group. Uh, Sonny and and so I said sure you know and, and so we're thinking if they reported to these people or they reported to these people or reported to these people it might be a lot better I said well why don't we look at the process yeah why don't we look at the process and what we found was 70 percent of their time was associated with variability that happened way upstream right way, way upstream but yet we were thinking about, well, we need to fix these people here. And I was saying, we need to fix the process up here. Right. And, you know, with that in mind, there's also, and I really love this in your work, um, a lot of people in design think about design and they don't think about the people and the real influence and impact that the people interacting with the design have. Um, can you enlighten us a little bit about your views on leadership and its role in the success or failure of, of quote, good design? 
Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, again, uh, what I have, like we all have, is our own experience. So, so I think about leadership, and I was, and I was blessed with having three Hall of Fame coaches, and and these are not people who screamed at; these were people who taught, you know, who who were great teachers in terms of in in terms of what, and and as I worked in organizations, I found that uh, one of the the great early leaders that I worked with. When Harvard came out to do a case study on on the the um, supply chain process, and and asked the leader, um, so what's different? The le leader, Sonny said, you know, I used to be I used to be rewarded for rapid and concise pro problem solving and decision making, as long as I got fifty one percent of the uh, the decision right, you know, I was on the right side of the ledger, right? And they said, well, what do you, what, what do you think your responsibility is today? And he, and he said, my responsibility is to clarify for people what's important and why, and then design and facilitate mechanisms so they can figure out the how to, because if they can figure out the how to, then they own, they they own what it is that that needs to go on. So so I, when I think about leadership, and and I'm of the school that that leaders can leadership is a set of activities. I don't think it's something we're born with. Mm -hmm. You know everything that everything that I know, I was blessed to have great people to work with. And they they taught me, and I I just tried to learn what best what good looked like and best practices. So so I think if you think about a set of leadership activities, and then to say of those leadership activities, and I've identified twelve that I think are pretty generic across any organization. If you can take those twelve activities and, and say of those twelve leadership activities. What are things that the teams could do themselves that if you developed your team to do those things themselves, that would free you up to do higher order work? So, so it, 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 it's it's such a huge win in terms of that. So the, let me give you an example. One of the things you like are examples. Yes. The premier uh, aircraft engine facility in the in the world. I, I had the privilege of working with them early, early on, and they built a concept that they said, we want uh, to have teams who build a complete engine, you know, boxcars coming in one end and going out the with a complete engine. And we want the teams to be as, as self-sufficient as possible, because we believe that the more self-sufficient they are, and doing that, and you, and you know you can't screw up on any any engine. You, this isn't a six sigma deal. This is it has to be perfect, right? Right. That if we can do that, we can we can take the the leadership or or what would have been in a traditional facility of leaders, and we can focus them upstream and work with the design community, and we can focus downstream with the people who maintain the equipment. So. So in a world where you're looking at value added in terms of people and their and their skill sets, this organization is as as you know the these teams around the product, but they have resources that go upstream and downstream in a way that is a is a beautiful thing. Whereas in a traditional organization, they would have been making sure that Paul and Susie and they were doing what they were doing and all of that. Rather than looking upstream, which which Bob you you've talked about, or looking downstream, so yeah, oh. the harmony the harmony between the steps along the way and how critical that is, and and also I really like this idea of leadership behaviors because so many people think of leadership as attributes. So thank you for giving us a unique spin on that as well. I think we're coming up 
toward our time when we want to uh, evaluate if we have some questions in the chat. So Brody, um, do you have anything from our audience? Sure, well, I could start with a question. So uh, in the course of your career, have you ever uh, had the opportunity, could you give an example of an organization you've worked with or you've been hired by where you've gone in and seen how they operate and thought, wow, I've never thought of this. You're, this is like, this is amazing. You're doing something right. And kind of like, what is, what is that? And what was the organization? What was your experience? So, um, yeah, great question. And, and, uh, um, so I, I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to, to work in Australia with, uh, their, their largest, um, energy company there. And, and, uh, and in working with this uh, this particular facility, um, and I said, uh, "What's different about this facility?" And and so this was a steel making facility. They made uh, angles and profiles in 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 terms of this. And they said, uh, "We don't have any rework area." So so no rework area because most most facilities have some sort of rework area. So, so you don't have any rework area. So, so that, that's so different, why not? And they said, well, if we don't design in a rework area, then we have to design that we will make it perfect. So, and was it perfect? <laughs> And and they knocked the they were the best in the world, mm -hmm. they were the best in the world. But but that kind of blows you away when you, when you're you know when you've seen you know organ they always have rework areas right because you know not everything works right and and that sort of thing. But the attitude that they had was well if we design in or if if we design it so there isn't a rework area then our focus is on making it perfect. Oh my gosh. Hmm. Different way to look at it. Makes sense. Okay, here's another question. Um, so it seems like uh, a lot of your experience has been going into companies and trying to solve a problem. What advice would you give to a new company or a new team uh, starting from scratch, uh, building their organizational culture and their processes to avoid, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line needing? Uh, your expertise. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, and by the way, I, I've worked with uh, seventy startup and new organizations, so so I love the question because uh, it's so so you have to anchor the organization in the beginning with what I call a strategic intent statement, and where where you work really hard around being clear about what your mission and vision is of the organization. What principles you're going to use? Um, what's going to be your space? And in your space, what is it that you're going to be unique at? And and what principles do you believe are going to guide you in terms of creating this great organization that does amazing things? And what are those measures? And use a balanced scorecard. But we 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 work really hard on the culture on defining the culture. What, what do you believe will really make a difference to achieve these outcomes that you're striving for? So what I would share with you in, in terms of four decades, uh, and I'm pretty biased on, on this in terms of my own experience, the number one thing that I would, I would build a culture around, and I would build a lot of design elements around that is competing on knowledge. So when I talk about competing on knowledge, I'm talking about learning orientation that you have, how, how you, you learn. I think that the most important criteria in a selection of any team member to a new startup is, is number one, is their, their ability to learn, their thirst for learning. So if you said to me, how would I know uh, what a person says. I might say, tell me what the last book you read, the last hobby that you did. Why did you do that? What did you do? So if the person said, we, well, we left, the, uh, I read this book and then I have a great friend. I did 
this and they they she shared with me this particular be and we talked to a number of other people and we got together and we said then you go oh my gosh this is the kind of person that we want to have then what you want to do is is so is selecting people who love to learn and apply so so then you want to create an organization where where the the culture is is around continuous sharing of knowledge you know, I, I have the privilege of working with an organization now that has, uh, you know, 100 and plus surgeons, and they have a, a, an incredible culture where they use uh, what's up, or what's uh, what's app, and uh-huh. they they share. Here's what I'm working on. This is this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working on. This is how I'm doing. You know, they're working on on sharing knowledge uh, across the organization. So, so there's a culture of of uh, of competing on knowledge, and and a culture of sharing that we're we we all want to learn and improve. And so, you know, it, it, we always look for you know the silver bullet. It's not the only thing, but the notion of of creating a culture that thrives on learning and applying, sharing and improving. Those four things: we learn, we apply, we share with one another, and we constantly improve. If if you're setting up an organization, my gosh, focus on those things as as you work on your sense of purpose. Connecting, my belief is, if, if we can connect the sense of purpose that people have who work there with the organization purpose, great things happen. Absolutely. Hey, Paul, I, just a, one last question from me. Um, when you, I, and I know you interact with a lot of organizations and companies and so forth, who's who's doing it right today out there as far as organizations or companies go? Are there one or two examples you can say, you know, wow, they're really blowing away this notion of minimizing silos, eliminating silos, creating organizational alignment, yeah, functional excellence is great, but they're connecting work teams at the right part of the process. Is are there are there folks out there that you could cite for us that maybe people who want to study more could could look at? Well, I think that uh, you know what's what's the question is a great question, and and I don't think anybody does it perfect, but the the great thing is that you've got a lot of people out there working, you know, working hard on particular elements of that so for example if you looked at uh if you looked at when we talked earlier about um <clears throat> design you know uh, ideo is a company that works really hard on on helping the design of of and an eclectic culture in terms of what it has you know you've got you've got supply chain companies that or platform not platform but platform companies that are working really hard in terms of improving their particular platform. My my own sense is that innovation is much easier in in more fast growing startup ish kind of organizations than the big monolithic organizations. It, it's just like uh, as one friend said, if we think of the, about the second law of thermodynamics, you know that all things move towards entropy, right? Mm-hmm. Is 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 that in organizations we call that bureaucracy, mm-hmm. and it, and it's hard, but but that you know there are some there are some great pockets of of working on those aren't much different than what you see in Inc. magazine or or Fortune in terms of best places to to work. That they're that they're working, but as you guys said, and why your subject is so powerful, is, is the more that that is across the system, you know, is a, across the system in terms of what they do, you know, the the better, you know, <clears throat> you know, so I can. Uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking about some that I'm working with that are, uh, you know, in in different uh, different fields. But one uh, paradigm oral surgery is a is a is a company that is doing incredible work because of the kind of culture and the design. 
they're they're just knocking it out of the park and they're the premier in their in their field and these are really bright people and 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 working together but following the the fundamentals that we had you know what what we just talked about uh huh that's really cool you know i really it's, again i'll say it was a thrill having you tonight i think we're we're close to uh the top of the hour here and i just um I think this what you're talking about tonight is something that unfortunately a lot of operations and supply chain professionals, executives never get a chance to think about, never get a chance to to hear about. And uh, it is so important, along with all of the other initiatives that are going on to make great supply chains, to create great organizations, you really need to think about your design um, and alignment. So uh from one of the one of the world's best uh meeting you paul really thank you so much for for your uh participation and and giving to us this evening sunny your thoughts yeah no, thank you paul um bob i really appreciated your questions as well as yours brody because i think we got a chance to really think in multiple dimensions about the subject matter expertise that paul has so Thank you, Paul. We appreciate you very much. Um, I hope that our listeners will take a look at some of your publications and perhaps even reach out to us afterward with some feedback or opportunities to ask questions or share knowledge with all of us here tonight. So, uh, Rudy, is there anything you want to close us up with tonight? Well, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed this. And um, there's always uh, the next session. Um, to think about. So um, we would then be into April, April 13th, um, and we'll talk about risk mitigation and probabilistic scenario planning. And uh, that will be a very exciting session again. Uh, but before we get there, I want to thank Paul for taking the time to talk to us. It was really insightful. I learned a lot, certainly. And um, yeah, th th thank you again for a great hour with you, Paul. Well, thank you. That was Thanks, everyone. Uh, always great stuff. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night.